guys, how's it going? So today's video is a midsummer garden tour, and this is a very interesting time of year. As you guys know, when it gets really hot, things start to look a little weary. We're right kind of in between bloom cycles of perennials, but there are some things that look really beautiful right now. And it's a good time of year to look like assess our gardens. I think midsummer and winter are great times to look and see where we've got holes where we need more interest. Um, so I wanted to start right back here by our kitchen entrance. This flower bed was full of spiderwort when we moved in. It was beautiful and green, but I've been working on getting some different textures in here. Um, so first off, you can see like this perennial right here is in between bloom cycles. There's a tiny bit of color, um, but soon I'm gonna be coming in and shearing this all back, you know, just to about where the foliage starts there. Um, and then we'll get a second flush of bloom. So that's kind of where we're at with a lot of our perennials. But there are some like this lamb's ear right here um, that are gorgeous all season long. And that's something that I'm trying to add more of in here. Now you can see I'm dealing with a little bit of a water issue in this area. There are some leaves that look a little bit bad. I think what I did, I ran new drip in here last year and I ran it in one big continuous circle for this whole entire area and never connected it back to itself. So I think that the water like toward the end of my drip tubing isn't really like the pressure isn't right. So I have to wait till all of the perennials are cut back this fall and I'm gonna do some testing and figure out where my issues are because I do have to bring a hose up here every single day to water this front stuff like the lamb's ear and then the Veronica always kind of flags a little bit um, in the heat. And it is getting close to 100 and over 100 the last week or so. So things are just feeling it. I am too. Um, but I am working on getting more stuff like this put in my flower beds that kind of take the pressure off the perennials to look good all the time because these already do. As you move down this area, you can see the radiculous coleus, which I've kind of allotted this space for a red colored coleus because I think it looks so beautiful. I put a little lemon coral in this bunny planter. One little plant, it is just like taking over this little planter here. Um, some Supertunia Morning Glory Charm, I believe. Um, and then we've got our boxwood hedge in here, uh, which we did trim up earlier this spring. It's looking a little bit fluffy, but still nice and green. But I wanted to kind of address how I've got everything planted in here. When you've got things planted densely like this, they act as their own weed suppression. I hardly ever have to maintain this bed in terms of weeds, which is awesome. Like I'll get little weeds right along the edge where there's nothing, but in here, I'll get the occasional weed pop up. And usually they have to get about this tall for me to even notice them. But really the maintenance is low for areas like this. And I know when you see gardens full of plants, oftentimes it looks like, oh my word, there's so much maintenance you have to do to keep that up. But really, I mean, there is in terms of like deadheading and cutting back, depending on what you choose to plant but like this area i hardly ever have to do anything to which is great on the other side of the sidewalk i've got my hedge of incredible hydrangeas and i don't know if you guys remember but last year i planted these they were down at the garden center and in a windstorm a big tree fell down and smashed them um, so i thought well i'll take them home and i'll plant them see what happens uh, you know plants are resilient and they will eventually rebound of course there's a few of them that look a little bit more shapely than the others this one's struggling a little bit in the shape department um, but I think they're all going to do really great. They look better than they did last year. And I think every consecutive year they'll look better and better. But I'm just so thrilled with the color. They come out, you know, with the bright white. And then they kind of age to this chartreuse color right here. Um, and I'm just enjoying them so much. So imagine a tight hedge of the Incredibles, my boxwood hedge, and then my hedge of Munstead lavender right there. I think it's just such a pretty blend of uh, plants. So I wanted to move this way. We had overcast for a while this morning. The sun's kind of peeking out. But I wanted to talk about these pots right here because I've just loved the mix. Um, so this is like a megawatt pink bronze. I'll put the name up on the screen. Uh, Begonia, Dichondra Silver Falls, and a Diamond Frost Euphorbia. I could spend a little time deadheading this one, but this group of plants has been so low maintenance and needs so little water. I've really enjoyed them back here. And they're all doing a fairly shaded area like kind of like mid-morning right now. This gets a little bit of morning sun and then it's in the shade for the whole rest of the day and the plants are still performing really wonderfully. So I wanted to head down this sidewalk right here. Um, this area was all roses when we moved in uh, and it gets a varying amount of sun, not enough for roses to be happy. Uh, and you can even tell like the lavender on this side gets more sun than the lavender on this side. And this lavender is doing it, but it's not quite as full as this. Um, so I've been just working on filling up this area. Everything's kind of in the young stages right now. We've got some ferns. There's a Crimson Queen Japanese maple back in there. Lots of hostas. 
Um, there are some delphiniums I just planted from four inch cans, um, peach berry ice hookahs, chocolate drop sedum. There's some poppies in there. And I don't know, it's kind of, it's hard when you plant a brand new bed because you want so much for everything to look like it looks in your mind, like how you can imagine it looking once everything reaches maturity and everything's flowering properly and like really full. So it's just, it's fun to kind of dream about those areas and I can't wait to see what it looks like in a year or two. More ridiculous coleus right here. Um, some Super Tunia Bordeaux and Royal Velvet. And those are a rose called Lemon Zest, which add a really pretty bright pop of yellow. Um, and they've been blooming sporadically since we planted them. I did plant some Agapanthus in here, and this was kind of a splurge for me because these are not perennial in our area. Over the last two winters, I think we've had a mild enough winter that these would winter over, but you never know because the winter before that, it got to negative 17. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I think, is just mulch these up like crazy. Just mulch them high and we'll see what happens. But I just desperately wanted to have them in my garden and just to see what they look like here um, and that they've been a real treat to have here. Um, I have been going through, I'm starting to prune things up, trees, shrubs. This lilac was not like this this spring. You know, once it puts on the uh, its blooms and it's got these little seed pods, it just gets so weighted down. Um, so I need to go through and lift up the canopies a little bit so that everything else can be happy underneath them. Uh, as we move this direction, well, first of all, can you guys see across this bench, like across this area and the flower beds in front of the gazebo look so pretty. They probably don't look in the camera like they do when you're standing here, but I just love how this area is filling in. I did want to talk about this brick circle because this is my favorite grouping of plants so far. When we moved in, it was just xeriscaped. There was native cactus, lavender, um, some sedum, things like that, and a lot of weeds. Um, and then last year I planted vertigo penicetum, mystic illusion dahlia, vermilion arcufia, and supertunia bordeaux, which the only reason I did that blend of plants was because that was the only plants I could get a lot of at that time, because I decided to plant it up really late in the season. Um, and it was, it performed, like the dahlias and the vertigos especially performed, but this blend of plants is so beautiful. We've got King Tut in the center. We've got Play in the Blue Salvia as a step down. And I don't know if you guys can see all of the honeybees on that salvia right now, but they are just everywhere. They are a pollinator attractor like crazy. We've got Diamond Mountain Euphorbia right below, which is it's the first year I've ever planted this one. It's fairly new, either new this year or next. I think new this year. Um, but it's a euphorbia that gets quite a bit bigger than the diamond frost that you might be familiar with. And then we've got a row of lemon coral seed. It's watering right now. I can hear a drip system in there. It's music to my ears. Um, but I think this is a very cooling blend. And when you have a really hot area, like this spot gets quite a bit of sun, uh, it's nice to have cool toned plants because it just brings that temperature down visually somehow. Right above it, you should take a look at this tree. This is a Chinese rain tree right here in its full glory. Um, we're going to be harvesting some of those for some decorating projects. I think my mom's going to come and grab big bundles of them. And I always encourage whoever wants to come cut these, do it now when they look awesome because they dry beautifully for projects. Um, but if I leave them on this tree and they fall on the ground, they will seed themselves everywhere. So I like to get them cut off as much as possible. I wanted to show you my Cherry Falls tomatoes here in the hanging baskets. I started these from seed early on this spring inside and then planted them out in these baskets. They're looking a little bit wind worn. They get, the wind comes right through here and just nails them. Um, but they don't really seem to mind in terms of fruit production. I mean, they are just going absolutely nuts. <laughs> They're beautiful. I think it's such a fun thing to have in a hanging basket. Um, the rest of the stuff right here, we've got a rhubarb. Um, and then I've got a couple of hanging baskets, which I do need to do some maintenance on. I don't know if you guys are in a position at this point of the year where your hanging baskets look a little bit tired. I'm getting ready to cut these up a little bit. So what I'll do is I'll come in and cut all of the foliage and blooms off even with the bottom of the pot on both of these. And what that will do is it'll eliminate the plant sending all the energy into keeping this kind of mangy growth alive and it'll produce more fresh growth and more flowers. Um, so that's something we may show you in a video. It's pretty easy to do. I just come in with scissors and just give it kind of a bowl cut along the bottom of the, the container. And then it takes maybe a week or week and a half, two weeks and it's just flushed back and beautiful again. Right here, a little update on our spaghetti pot. And it's kind of funny that I have a tomato that's this out of control. I just did a video on maintaining my tomatoes in my garden space. I should have just run over here and taken care of this one. I did for a while. I've been keeping it pruned down below and I just kind of let this top growth go nuts. So I need to come in and do a little bit of maintenance, but there are quite a number of tomatoes on 
uh, this tomato plant. This is a garden treasure. Um, right here, I love this blend of plants. This is a Sweet Caroline Lime Green with Supertunia Bordeaux, Prince Tut. I planted some Pentas in here. This is Pentas Superstar Pink, I think. Um, and I love it. I think it's such a delicate color. First year I've ever grown Pentas. And I planted in both in containers and in the landscape. And I do have to say that the Pentas in the landscape are doing much better than mine in the containers. I mean, they look okay, but they're just not growing quite as bulky. Um, and then I've got some other things here, just some random pots. There's some mint and some Ruby Glow Euphorbia. I did want to show you our tool shed because it does look a little bit different maybe than the last time you saw it. Um, our chicken coop and tool shed matched the color of our barn, which is kind of like a blue gray color. And we wanted to kind of start shifting everything to match our house a little bit better. So the chicken coop, you know, is white and with black accents, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and we just had the tool shed painted white. I am on the hunt for a neat antique door to have cut to fit this right here. And that will be black. And then I had the same light installed here as we did on the chicken coop. And I have a really fun project planned for right here. So I wanted to show you this is kind of like a before or a midway, I guess, um, shot. Anyway, view into the gazebo right here. I've always loved this. It feels pr like rustic and restful and a little bit more natural. I don't know if it's the pine trees or just kind of the overflowing style of plants, but I do love this area. And we just did a gazebo makeover. So I love looking in there and seeing the pretty furniture. All right, let's head in front of the chicken coop. This area is brand new this year, you guys know. Um, so I just kind of wanted to give you an update on what's going on. Cottage garden needs a little bit of maintenance um, in terms of deadheading. We did have, we've been having a lot of wind. Um, I don't know if you guys deal with a lot of wind, but it kind of, it blows in a lot of, a lot of junk that I need to come in and rake out. Uh, and it feels like it's a constant. And I always feel like I walk around the garden and if I ever feel like it's coming together and everything's looking so, so beautiful and full, it like kind of it happens that night where we have a huge windstorm and I'm like well that just put me right back <laughs> in my place and reminds me that I am not in control of what happens in my garden you know it, things just happen weather is just it can be the worst and it can be the best um, but this area is really coming along beautifully I mean I love the look down our little pellet walkway here you can kind of see down in and see the carex and some uh, hydrangeas back in there um, I did pop some purple fountain grass in around this birch tree. So this is new. This is an avalanche birch. These grow quite large, like 50 feet tall, and I think the spread is about 30 feet. So it's 15 foot on center. It'll grow 15 feet from the center of the trunk this way. So I want to train some of the branches to kind of go over the run right here because we do have an ash tree that's right in front of me, but we just lost a big branch in a windstorm. And ash trees and elm trees, which is the huge one right here, are prone to borers in our area unless you dump chemicals on them. And I don't think that these have had that sort of treatment. So they're slowly starting to kind of, you know, lose branches. So I'm thinking that planting some trees like this around the area that can kind of start to get established as these are kind of slowly dying out is a good idea. That way our chicken coop will have shade going forward. Um, I think that's really important. And I'm planting things that aren't quite as prone to the issues that these are prone to. Um, but I've got some beautiful things. I mean, right in here, there's some blushing princess alyssum, trailing rose vein, supertunia, supertunia bordeaux, um, cosm white cosmos. I've just kind of planted this really full of just fun color and it's very free and more cottagey feeling. This bed right here, and there's the girls. There they are. Um, so we did a video where I planted three roses in here and we'll put the name of them up on the screen because I cannot remember what the name of them is, but they're beautiful, like a kind of apricot orangey color, Supertunia Bordeaux, Lemon Coral Sedum, a Miss Violet Butterfly Bush right back in here, which I need to start training these. These are Zephyrin Druin Climbing Roses. There are four of them planted around the coop and I want to train those up and over because these get really good size and they're nearly if not all the way thornless. Um, so this will provide some really great shade as well. We've got a weeping Colorado blue spruce, which I need to add a, a new stake to so I can continue to stake it up. Otherwise it will want to kind of weep and kind of go around the ground. And I do want a little bit of vertical interest evergreen wise right here for the winter time. Um, there's the pure white butterfly Marguerite Daisy looking beautiful. I love this. Isn't that pretty? That mix right there. This is the Indiglo Girl Salvia, which needs to be cut back at this point. Uh, we've got a purple fountain grass, some delightful, lively lavender dahlias. These are just such beautiful flowers. I have much better luck with dahlias in the ground 
as opposed to containers, kind of like the Pentas. And I don't know if it's user error, if I'm doing something wrong, um, but they just seem to perform really well right here. Um, this is the Yellow My Darling Echinacea with the lemon coral sedum edge in front continuing on. Oh, do you like my curtain? Okay, <laughs> you can probably see it, so I thought I'd mention it. I just had an old burlap sack and I needed to provide some shade and I just popped it up on a couple of nails. It works for now. I do plan on putting something more decorative in there. The annuals here are doing well. I planted three vertigo penicetum, some lime thyme coleus, and surefire rose begonias. This has been zero maintenance right here other than fertilizing. And then I wanted to stop here and give you guys a update on our firelight hydrangeas. Aren't they beautiful? So first year hydrangeas right here. We just planted these, I think it was in May, maybe end of April, beginning of May. And they look like this. I mean, this is so beautiful. I think they're gonna just thrive in this spot. They get strong sun for a good portion of the day, maybe until about three or four in the afternoon. And then they're protected from that really hot afternoon sun. Now they are burning a tiny little bit, um, especially the ones down this way. And it's interesting. Um, we've planted annuals in this area for two years in a row before this. And I've noticed that the annuals do great, like great, great, great. And then the health starts to decline as we get closer to the willow. And I think what's happening is this curly willow tree is sucking all of the moisture and nutrients from the soil the closer you get to it. Um, so I think what I need to do is add in extra emitters into my drip tubing for at least these three on the end. I might up the emitters for the other ones as well, but as they get more established, they won't need quite as much as they do like this first year. And I was expecting a tiny bit of burn just because they are baby plants, but I'm noticing a little bit of color. So they come out this gorgeous white color. And then as the season progresses, they start to change. You see all that little pink in there? And then they will morph even more. You guys are gonna be amazed. I'm gonna be amazed at how these are gonna look even just a couple of months from now. These containers have been so fun. I planted these in a vlog. I think it was a vlog. Uh, lemony lace elderberry. Isn't that a unique centerpiece for a container? I was kind of like, when I put them in the container, I wasn't sure. I thought, I don't know, this might be weird. I don't know if they will like it in the container with other things, but they've done really well. There's a Wicked Witch Coleus, which will be out next year, doing great. The anemones, these are falling in love sweetly, I believe, and they bloomed beautifully. Um, and I believe they'll put on a little bit more bloom. They're pink. Dichondra Silver Falls, which this side gets wind. You can see them a little bit better right here. Dichondra Silver Falls, Diamond Frost Euphorbia. Everything is played really nicely. Oh, here's a bloom right here. Look at that. Oh, I just, I just wrecked it. <laughs> That's the color right there. Dang, maybe we can throw a picture up on the screen. That's the color of their bloom right there before I wrecked it. Um, but you can see all the different plants right in this little section. So they play nicely. Instead of, I'll show you a container over here where the coleus has been kind of a thug. I wanted to kind of look at this area because I think as a whole, everything looks so pretty. I mean, I can get in close and I see all the things that need to be cut back and weeded and maintained and fertilized. But when I step back and I'm like, you know, Things are coming together. I'm adding things in, you know, as I find holes and as I find a need for like an evergreen, I'll pop something in. Um, and I've moved a lot of things around. That's just kind of the name of the game to get it right. And I feel like I'll be doing that forever, um, but that's kind of the fun. I love the pallet walkway, which has been amazing. I had quite a number of comments on that video about termites and um, them rotting out really quickly, but you just have to understand our climate. We don't do we have termites in our area? I, we've never really dealt with that. Um, we also are a very dry climate, so we don't deal with constant rainfall. And um, so they're really staying together beautifully. If you live in a, an area where it rains all the time, this is probably not the option for you, but it's been such a fun, whimsical area. Um, I never thought I would have a pallet walkway. And that, I think that's why it surprises me why I, um, that I like it so much. Here's another area as we're right here. I just wanna point this out. Another area where I have the lambs here where it looks much happier. It's getting proper water here. And look at that boldness. It's so soft. Something that Benjamin loves. It's such a tactile, beautiful plant. So this is the kind of thing that I want to add more of in my garden. Pinky Winky Hydrangea standards are doing wonderfully on both sides. So there's one on this beam and one over here. And I was a little bit um, 
nervous, especially for this one, because this one struggled a little bit last year. It didn't have a super developed root system when I put it in, and this one gets more sun than this one does. So I thought, oh, I don't know, because it was kind of burning, and I was putting tons of water on it, and it's doing great now. So it just goes to show you that first year, you can never really judge, like my firelight hydrangeas. They look gorgeous, but that little bit of burn will probably not happen next year because they'll be more established, like this one. So these are the containers I was talking about. We've got chocolate drop coleus, wicked hot coleus, dichondra silver falls, look at that. Look at those three together. There's also some diamond snow euphorbia in there, which hindsight was completely unnecessary because these plants, unless you're the type who likes to go out and trim your plants all the time and maintain and fuss with your planters, I mean, more power to you, you'd probably be able to see the euphorbia. I am not that type of person. I want to put them on drip, put the plants in, and I don't really want to do anything with them. And that's why I like to plant tons of supertunias because you don't have to deadhead them. You hardly ever have to trim them. I mean, just the hanging baskets. But I'll show you the hair axe in a minute. And I, I mean, you guys will be amazed at how those look. So full of blooms and I haven't touched them. Love this area right now. You can see my little collection of ferns on the ground right here. I'm trying to find a spot for them. These are Boston ferns um, that I'll probably put in a sun porch. I think they'll be really pretty, but this is a nice shaded area for them to hang out until I figure it out. But this view, if you can see through here, you can see the iceberg roses blooming in the background behind our fireplace area. Um, and that's just what I major on this time of year are the vistas. You know, you, like I said, you can see this time of year when everything's feeling weary and you're, you know, the plants are looking weary, you're feeling weary. It's easy to kind of be like, oh my goodness, everything's just going to pot. Um, and you step back and look at all your vistas and all the views and how it's coming together. And it's just so encouraging to look at your garden that way. I love this pergola here. We've got Virginia creeper growing over the top of it and coming through. It feels very magical right here to me. Um, summerific, very awesome. In fact, let's go around this way. You can see these hibiscus beautifully from this other view. I just worked in this flower bed yesterday. I did some cutting back and fertilizing and that sort of thing. But this view is really pretty as well. You can see all the different colors and textures and everything going on. We've got the flashpoint nephophia that I planted last year, just coming into bloom. Anna's magic ball. If you guys need an evergreen that stays compact, nice and tight, this is full grown right here. Um, just about 18 inches by 18 inches, maybe a tiny bit bigger, and that's it. This is like a perfect cap to the walkway right here. So this is a flower bed I worked on yesterday. We've got a drift of blue fescue. There's some uh, nepeta called cat's pajamas. I just cut back. Daisy made daisies. There's the summerific berry awesome hibiscus. Look at those blooms. Do you guys remember when I planted those last year, I think? And you know, I'm just excited about how they're coming along. Now there are three. This one right here is horribly iron deficient but I'm actually thinking I'm gonna treat it and I'll probably wait to transplant it, but I think I might pop it out and put it somewhere else and put some kind of a topiary or something right here. I think I could use a little bit of height because I've got a sunshine blue caryopteris right here, which has got the gorgeous yellow foliage with blue blooms, which are starting. I can see the buds. They'll start blooming here in a little bit. And then our penicetum right there. So I think I could use a little bit of height right here. And then this bed is super fun. I love it. I love the layering. I've posted a couple of pictures on Instagram about this spot because it started out pretty much nothing this year except for a couple of hostas. I planted the Bloodgood Japanese Maple, Marie's Double File Viburnum, all the hostas, almost all of them right up here and then this big one back here. These were transplanted from other areas in my garden. This kind of became my hosta sick bay after we had that hailstorm and I just kind of wanted to gather a lot of them into one area and let them rebound. And I think it's gonna be gorgeous next year when they come back with fresh foliage and hopefully we don't have another hailstorm like that again. Uh, and this whole area will be just decked out with different hostas. There's wicked hot coleus. So this is kind of my trial in the ground versus in the containers they are doing well in both areas. We've got Supertunia Bordeaux here with the white gomfrina and Salpoglossus, which is, this is the first time I've ever grown it. Wonderful cut flower right there really pretty colors too. And the TP, <laughs> it's not doing as well as I hoped. So I planted the lemon appeal thumbergia around it. The front ones are obviously doing a lot better. Um, they're all the way up here already. Uh, they just kind of sat here. They were fine. They looked fine. They looked healthy. I've been fertilizing them and it hasn't been until it just got really hot that they've started to put on growth. So I'm hoping that they start booming and we get a lot of growth really quickly. Um, the beans I planted around here got totally eaten. Um, so I didn't even bait, 
or nothing. I just kind of, it happened so fast. They came up, got eaten, and I just didn't replant. Um, the Supertunia Tower here is gorgeous. Erin uh, was right with the less is more in this case because I think eventually, I mean, you won't even be able to see any of the green stock garden that we planted them in. I wanted to plant more than this because that's my first inclination always is to pack stuff in, but I think this was a good call because I think this will be, they'll be happier longer when they're not so tightly planted. Right below it, we have Superbina Sparkling Amethyst with Supertunia Bordeaux and then the Prince Tut doing beautifully together. And this is one of my favorite views. When you look out this way and you can see down this little brick pathway, you can see Hebe over there and some lawn. I always appreciate a little bit of lawn because it's breathing space. It's just like some restful area where there's just, like your eye can just, it's calm. You can see I haven't done very much more to this area for the kids' garden. I have a lot of plans, just haven't had time to execute yet. I did plant a little baby boo pumpkin, and there's some little pumpkins in there already, which is so fun. Um, some super tunias right there. I want to do some uh, fo a fountain and some stepping stones, so that'll happen eventually. And then I've got some work to do in this area here, but I've got hardy geraniums that come over the path, and I love that. The Powis Castle Artemisia. You can see the purple fountain grass is peeking through. Um, but I kind of want to go this direction. First off, I want to show you the Blue Chiffon Rosa Sharon Standard. Now these were in our containers up in Versailles last year, and I transplanted these out really late in the season, so I was nervous for them. I didn't know if they would make it, and they both did, and they're blooming beautifully. So now let's walk through the gazebo and take a quick look at those beds right up there, because they're so pretty. I know we just recently did a tour, but I just can't get over this coleus up here. I would not have planted so many if I would have known how big they would have gotten. Um, so the Color Blaze series of coleus, which this is part of, it's called Golden Dreams, um, says it can handle both full sun and full shade. And I thought, well, we'll see. I'm gonna put it in a full sun spot, which on a sunny day, this, this area gets sun from early morning until pretty late in the afternoon. So it gets a really long block of sun and I think it likes it. <laughs> I think it's doing really well. In fact, I planted some roses in here, which this is my favorite color combination right now. Look at the carding mill rose with the Golden Dreams Coleus is gorgeous, but the Golden Dreams Coleus is just like swallowing everything alive. So it's something I'm definitely gonna repeat because I think it's gorgeous, but just do fewer of them. Um, anyway, we did a full tour with all the plant names and all of that, and we'll try to remember to link it down below if you're interested. Uh, and learning more about them because I'm thrilled. I mean, you guys, other than the North Pole Arborvitae, all of this is brand new this year. Can you believe that? Brand new and it's this full. Oh, so fun. And so this big lawn area, I mean, we may make some of the flower beds a little bit wider, especially over here. Like I was thinking about um, making this flower bed to kind of encompass the crab apple and then taking it kind of over there. I'm not sure yet. I don't want to take too much grass away because this is our only really big open piece of grass where Benjamin can play. So we don't want to don't want to sacrifice too much of it, but maybe a little bit as we go and we run out of room for plants. You know, you got to make more room. Up here in Versailles, we in fact we just put up an update video about it this morning. We showed you how the annuals are doing. I love this area because it just feels so tidy all the time. And that's the beauty of formal gardens is oftentimes, especially if there's not a lot of hedging, um, you just have kind of, you know, grass sections like this and gravel, it's super easy to maintain. And it always looks pretty good to me anyway. I did, however, come out and I think I've got some before and after pictures of this tree. I had to prune so much of this tree off. I mean, you couldn't even see, I was standing out in the driveway and I couldn't see the gazebo. The branches were about this low. Like it was crazy. And I, was, I took off some big branches. You can see like big branches up in this tree. So it lightened up the whole canopy. In fact, I need to do a whole lot of that. And I've showed you in a couple videos where I took after the locusts up front and then I took after the weeping willow and I have a whole lot more to do um, in terms of just pruning and maintenance. But I just love this area. And the denim and lace Russian sage is one of the best things. I'm so glad. This is the perennial we chose for this area because it provides color for so long. It provides food for pollinators and it's tough as nails. I just am so thrilled with it. Love it. So let's head up to the front garden here. You can see the hay racks, can't you, from this area. Let's head out there first actually before we head up toward the front. They're looking so good. I love the color blend this year. I love that we used less than half the amount of plants. 
in each one of the baskets that I did than I did last year. In the uh, big pots here, we've got Vertigo Penicetum and Supertunia Vista Bubblegum. I also planted Diamond Mountain Euphorbia, um, and you can see it a little bit if you get up close, but um, hindsight on this one as well, it didn't keep up with the vigor of these other two, so I wouldn't have needed to plant those. But I think the most impressive part this year is the way the hayracks look from behind. And that's what I was hoping. I was hoping that the plants would grow both in front and behind and create this beautiful avenue of color back here. Uh, we had a lot of questions, especially when we initially put these hay racks on the fence, as to why we faced them out rather than in so that we could see them from our house. Well, we can't really see this fence line from, uh, we can see it from a, a couple windows, but not from all of them. What we wanted was to create a really pretty entrance. So when people are driving down our lane, which it's a fairly long lane, they would be able to see this beautiful, and we would be able to see this beautiful uh, fence line of color. But this year it's kind of a bonus, and it did it a little bit last year too, but we have all this gorgeous color like on both sides, and I just love it. Um, also, right up here, we planted some Suncredible sunflowers, which we were just trying out. They're new next year from Proven Winners. And I planted a little hedge of them right behind our boxwoods right here. And I think it's so pretty. It's something I might do next year as well. I love the different colors of green. You can see kind of that almost chartreuse, uh, more uh, maybe not emerald. I don't know, just a, a very different color. This is more sagey and soft. And this is more kind of bright and glossy. And then these flowers have just been blooming their heads off. Since the moment I planted them, they've been blooming. And they were about this tall and maybe this big around when I, plume, or when I planted each one of them. And they've grown into this like massive thick hedge, which is just beautiful. <laughs> okay, let's go back in. All right, so this area right here where we've got our Hebe fountain underneath this crabapple tree, I did plant some annuals this year, which I haven't done before. Um, we've got some coral colored impatiens. We planted the Gold Coast hostas earlier this spring in this area, and they're doing really great. Um, more coleus with the coral impatience. Woo, I see I need to do some trimming. I'm running into the branches. Look at how beautiful this is right here. The coleus intermingled with the impatience. I think it's so pretty. Impatience over there and a fresh gopher mound, I'm just seeing. Look at this. This area, this is a gopher mound right here. This area has been just riddled with gophers. In fact, I planted Amsonia in here over there the like two years ago. Most of the roots got eaten out from under them from gophers. And I'll come out here and find a hosta or something like completely uprooted and it's the gophers. So it's just something I'm battling right here. Um, I still haven't connected <laughs> the Hebe fountain. She's just a nice piece of statuary at this point. Um, up here, is quite different than last year. So I planted a lot of truffula pink gomfrina up here, a lot of it. So I've got it in the centerpiece of both of these cutouts with Supertunia Morning Glory Charm and Lemon Coral Sedum, which is a pretty blend. I do think this area might be getting a little bit too much water because it's all watered from overhead. About every other day right now when it's so hot, um, the gomfrina is doing great. Most of the lemon coral is doing great. And the supertunias have a lot of color, but I am noticing some yellowing foliage, and I think that's due to overwater because these have been getting consistent fertilizer. So they're getting the nutrients they need. I think it's a water issue, but it's still really pretty. Right here, now I kind of um, got rid of the privet hedge and then put in this kind of wild gomfrina hedge. Um, so we had the AC unit right back in here, and this bed is going to change again. Um, we had a tour this June and so I kind of quickly planted some things in here because I wanted it to be full and something pretty and it and it is pretty but I do think I'm going to transplant this evergreen that's here and I may put in uh, some sort of I don't know something bigger maybe deciduous or a fountain I might do some big either big concrete container or big concrete fountain right here for some really pretty sound and structure um, because this area is just like right now to me we've got one, two, three, four, five, six at last roses creating a hedge, which will stay. The limelight hydrangea I transplanted from where they moved the AC unit on the other side of the house. I dug that up and brought it here to maybe create a little bit of balance because this area will never be 100% balanced because this is not balanced. You know, I've got a sun porch on one side and then it just doesn't extend as far. It's not the same. Um, so I can kind of strive for a little bit of balance in that I've got limelights on this side and then one limelight filling in this area over here. So it kind of does it a bit. We'll see how it, how it does. This one, even though it's quite a bit shorter, smaller, it's still blooming and it's doing great. It's, it survived the transplant wonderfully. 
And these I'm gonna be cutting back a little bit harder this year so they don't get quite as big, or next year, so they don't get quite as big. But oh my word, do they love this spot or what? They're doing so great. Um, and I'm also thinking, I want your opinion, I'm thinking next year I'm gonna plant a boxwood hedge in front of these. So it's very crisp and clean and this can be a little bit more, you know, a little bit more wild and then I'll have my formality and my um, tidiness in a boxwood hedge here. I think that'd be really pretty. Um, recently kind of uh, went through this flower bed in a video where I took after this locust tree that was just going crazy. I mean, it was growing into the lilac tree or the lilac bush and the lilac is kind of, uh, I don't know. This bed is gonna go through some more transformations, I think. I did plant a red point maple back behind the lilac, knowing that this would probably need to go at some point. And I was actually visualizing it gone the other day. I stood way back and I just thought about it. And I thought, you know what? It actually lightened this area up so much. Right now it's kind of taken over by, by Virginia creeper, which I do like the natural look of that. Um, but I think it'd be pretty to have the red point fill in there and then plant some other things, some like maybe three, a grouping of three neat evergreens in here, you know, and then be able to underplant with more shrubs and kind of maybe get rid of this um, structure because I've had to cut so much of it out of, out of it that was dead um, that it's now kind of an awkward shape and I have no idea what it's gonna look like in the winter because now it's okay, but it's covered with vines. So we just don't really know yet. So let's head to the west side. Although if you kind of stand and look down the side of our house here it is looking pretty good you can see the pentas and you can see some things filling in and growing but i have done a lot of perennial cutbacks so i don't really want to go in and <laughs> show that one really close up it needs some structural work over there um, but i kind of wanted to end over here by the west side and by our vegetable garden because this area has so much development yet to come and i'm trying to decide whether or not to stay all white like all white blooms with tones of green foliage or to go more cottagey um, and i do think i'm leaning toward the more white because i think it's beautiful and it's calming it's peaceful to look at and it's something completely different than the rest of my garden which is kind of willy-nilly lots of different color and you know the thing about it is that i probably will be still planting quite a number of annuals on this side so i could take it white next year and then if i decide i want some color then i can pop in some colorful annuals um, in their place the years after but I've just enjoyed seeing this area just the way it is right now. I mean, just the structure of it. It's just been such a fun area. Um, everything in the vegetable garden is doing well too. Like everything is coming along. Um, my tomato plant that I cut back really hard in a video is doing great. In fact, I did put a piece of harvest guard on it and I wanted to show you because I talked about providing some sun protection um, and I left my hose out. But I talked about providing some sun protection after you prune them hard, either by using a big umbrella or putting a piece of shade cloth around them. I didn't, couldn't find any shade cloth in our barn, but I had this piece of harvest cloth, which I use this for everything, you guys. And it's been working out really, really well. And you can see all the tomatoes, like it's been several days. Look at this. Look at this plant. You think it liked its prune job? I think so. I think it's doing really well. I'll probably leave this cover on for maybe a day or two more just to give it a little bit more acclimation time to our sunny days and hot temperatures and then I'll take it off. I do need to do a little bit more pruning on top but overall this is doing really well and everything else in here other than my zucchini plant which got infested with squash bugs and I just got fed up with it and I just cut the entire thing back like all the leaves. I cut all of the leaves off. In fact I'll show you. I hate to end a garden tour on this. Um, but here's my zucchini plant. <laughs> I cut it back to everything except for these leaves, which still looked good at the, on that day. Everything else looked horrible. Um, and it's actually producing more leaves. So I may not have killed it, which is awesome. I need to prune these off. And I know this is horrifying to look at, um, but I just like, it was so covered in squash bugs and I keep everything organic in here. Um, and I really, like I had sprayed it maybe one time. I really, I didn't stay on top of it like I should have. Um, and so I just decided, you know what, I'm gonna kill them all. I squished, like, I don't even know. I squished all the squash bugs with my gloves and I just cut the whole thing down. It was kind of a moment of garden insanity out here, but I'm just thrilled to see that it's producing more leaves and there's even little zucchini on here. So we'll see what happens. I'll keep you updated on this little massacre, zucchini massacre. So anyway, almost done with the tour. There's just two more things I wanna show you. First off, this Colette rose. Colette climbing rose is absolutely beautiful. This is like one of my favorite colors out in the garden. And I think it looks really good against the black um, and they're doing just so well. In fact, so well that I need to be a little bit more diligent about training them up the trellis or, or the arbor. 
but I also wanted to show you this limelight hydrangea standard. So I planted two of these, one on either side of the vegetable garden. You can see the other one back there just shining away. Um, but this was a complete experiment because this spot gets sun on a sunny day. It's overcast today, but sun from early morning until it gets dark at night. Uh, and I just thought, you know what, we're going to see. We're going to see if these can actually take full on high desert sun, no humidity, you know, over 100 degree temperatures. Um, and it's done really well. I think the key is just water. They just need a lot of water. And as long as you can provide them the water they need, they can handle a lot more sun than we've previously thought, than I've pre previously thought anyway. So I thought you guys might like to see that because it's been a fun experiment. And I cut these back hard this spring when they came out and started to bud. I cut them down like the trunk came up and I cut them to about a globe this big. <laughs> and they've really uh, branched out and done well. So anyway, it's actually starting to rain a little bit, which is crazy in July for us. So I'm going to end the tour right here. I hope you guys enjoyed seeing what's going on, how things are looking, and we'll give you more updates as the season progresses. We'll see you in the next video. Bye.